Today I want to do something that I've wanted to do for a long time, which is to do Mrs. Dalloway's walk. You probably already know that Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf is one of my all-time favourite novels, and I've revisited it so many times and I did my dissertation on it that it almost feels like this book is a part of me. Mrs. Dalloway is a novel of walking. Virginia Woolf is kind of obsessed with people walking, I think, through cities. Like with Room of One's Own, you have the anonymous narrator take you on a tour of London. And Mrs. Dalloway, for me, does exactly that. Mrs. Dalloway leaves her house in Westminster to buy flowers for her party. As she walks through London, her kind of her life and her past unravels. And also, as she's walking, her life is connected or mirrored by another character called Septimus Warren Smith. Septimus Warren Smith is a shell-shocked soldier. Finally said that so many times saying it. All these characters are moving through London together. They often see each other, but they never really interact. A big part of this novel is the separation between the private and the public. And that is both in space in terms of the fact that Clarissa leaves her private house and goes out into the world, but it's also the private and public within ourselves and what we share with people. There is a constant failure in communication. The fact that communication could potentially save characters and change their lives, but they never truly come together. But having lived in Westminster, how many years now? Over 20. One feels even in the midst of traffic, awaken at night. Clarissa was positive, a particular hush of solemnity, an indescribable pause of suspense. But that might be a heart affected, they said, by influenza before Big Ben strikes. There. Out it boomed. First a warning, musical. Then the hour, irrevocable. The leaden circles dissolved in the air. Such fools we are, she thought, crossing Victoria Street. The sound of Big Ben strikes at the very centre of this novel. It punctuates it. Time itself punctuates the novel because obviously it's set in one day. You just have these characters in their, you know, 12 hours or so and Chris's party. people's eyes, in the swing, tramp and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwich men shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead. <laughs> was what she loved, life in London this moment of June. We're in St James's Park, which is where Miss Dalloway first comes after leaving her house in Westminster. How strange on entering the park, the silence, the mist, the hum, the slow swimming happy ducks, the pouched birds waddling, and who would be coming along with his back against the government buildings? Most appropriately, carrying a dispatch box stamped with the Royal Arms, who but Hugh Whitbread, her old friend Hugh, the admirable Hugh. After meeting Hugh, Chris's past keeps rippling through the novel with thoughts especially of Peter Walsh, her first kind of flame, I guess, and her another maybe flame, Sally Seaton. I love walking in London, said Mrs. Dallery. Really, it's better than walking in the country. Meeting Hugh reminds Clarissa that her husband Richard is so different to Peter Walsh and is probably a bit more like Hugh. Peter always teased her and said that one day she would marry a politician or a prime minister. And in a way, when Clarissa realises that her reality has turned out a lot more like Peter had suggested, she feels that something was missing, something went slightly wrong. And Clarissa starts unravelling her past and questioning 
the decisions she made and what she's become. She is now just Mrs Dalloway, she's not Clarissa anymore. The life at Bolton that in fact when the big novel begins, instead of kind of going straight into urban London, Clarissa is taken back to being 18 at Bolton and in a world of possibility and hope and young love. The reality of her life is so different now and Peter coming back brings that to the forefront of her mind. What I find interesting about the two characters is that they're very similar. Um, Virginia Woolf actually uses the same kind of metaphor throughout for both characters. For instance, Chris has constantly been described as slicing through things and plunging, and Peter Walsh is always seen fiddling his knife. It seems in her walk across the park, all these questions have really started to pop up. And as she leaves St Joseph's Park to head towards Piccadilly, she is feeling quite odd with the world. She had the oddest sense of being herself invisible, unseen, unknown. There being no more marrying, no more having children now, but only this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them at Bond Street. This being Mrs Dalloway, not even Chris anymore, this being Mrs Richard Dalloway. We're now at Hatch House in Piccadilly, one of Chris's stops. Hatch House is one of the oldest bookshops in London, it's one of my favourites as well. But what was she dreaming as she looked into Hatch House shop window? What was she trying to recover? What image of white dawn in the country as she read in the book spread open? Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter rages. This late age of world's experience of read in them all, all men and women are well of tears. Tears and sorrows, courage and endurance. A perfectly upright and historical bearing. I just found this new edition of Miss Dalloway. It's a Penguin English Library designed by Coily Bickford Smith. It's part of their new series. When I buy this, I will now have three editions of Miss Dalloway, which some would argue, aka okay, Ben, um, would argue that it's a couple too many, but he is completely wrong. So this is where I spend all my money. Royal Arcade just off Bond Street. Bond Street is where Chris Dallery comes to shop for her party. Bond Street fascinated her. Bond Street early in the morning in the season, it's flags flying, it shops, no splash, no glitter. One roll of tweed in the shop where her father had bought his suits for 50 years. A few pearls, salmon on an ice block. Bond Street is where Clarissa comes to buy those flowers in the famous first line of Mrs Dalloway. As she's buying flowers for her party, they all suddenly stop as they hear a sound of a car backfiring. At first we think it's a pistol and everybody stops and then you have the two characters, Clarissa and Septimus Warren Smith, unite together by hearing that sound. Inside Mulberry's flower shop, a car passes by and all the people around it on Bond Street, all rumour starts to circulate of who is in the car. Is it the Prime Minister, the Prince of Wales or the Queen? Mrs Dallow is a really interesting novel because although you have um, several kind of points of view or the focus on the narrative, they're all privileged to a certain extent. What is interesting about what Wolf does when she brings that car forward is that you have a variety of different people that all brought together at that moment to wonder who's in the car. Septimus, however, is still rooted to the ground. He cannot move. One of the big themes in this novel is the need to conceal failure, and that's a line in the novel. It's a need to kind of give out a performance of being okay and respectable. And Lucrezia, when she sees that her husband is struggling and unable to do anything, she feels that people must be watching her, and what she needs to do is take Septimus to Regent's Park, where we'll be going next, to almost conceal him. As Dora and Smith continue their journey up through London, Clarissa returns home to prepare for her party. As she is preparing, Peter Walsh plunges back into her life um, and interrupts her and suddenly all those feelings and thoughts um, that she was thinking about are completely confronted by the actual man. Their meeting is intense and when Peter leaves, Clarissa shouts at him as he's walking out, scuffling out of the door quite quickly. 
remember my party, remember my party. And those words hang heavy in the air of London. The idea of Cliffs and her party, she was meant to be this hostess apparently to Peter and suddenly she's fulfilling that role and that unsettles them both. Peter then leaves Cliffs' house to walk through London and Trafalgar Square. He soon then becomes fascinated and fixated on a woman. She's a young woman again that reminds him of Clarissa, this slight fetishization of youth and the possibility of what could have happened. Clarissa's daughter Elizabeth is also the symbol of this new womanhood. Elizabeth is a pioneer astray. She can travel to places where Clarissa wouldn't have dared to go. She can go across class and move throughout the city more freely. As they head into the park, it becomes aware that everybody in London is aware of writing in the sky. What I like about Virginia Woolf is that even though it is focused on a couple of characters, as I said before, she just brings in other voices and she shifts the narrative onto different people as everybody's trying to work out what an aeroplane is writing in the sky. It turns out that it's an advertisement for toffee. As Dora and Smith are in the park, they both start to contemplate their life. Red Sierke had come over from Italy and she soon realises that her marriage has become something very different. Septimus' shell shock also has a massive impact on her and she even notices that her hands are getting thin and her wedding ring symbolically doesn't seem to fit anymore. She starts comparing London to Italy and her life starts to unravel and makes her question everything. Retzia is full of shame. I mean, the reason she brings Septimus into Regent's Park is to conceal him as he started to mutter things out loud and she's worried that people will overhear him. Septimus' shell shock really comes to life, I guess, in Regent's Park as he starts to imagine Evans, a soldier, a peer, a hallucination um, of his horrific experiences in the war come back to haunt him. Peter Walsh is also in the park at the same time as Lauren Smith and they do see each other. Again another moment in the novel where all the characters are in the same place but there's no communication. Septimus and Rex's time regent's park is suddenly interrupted by the reminder that they are walking towards Harley Street for an appointment to see William Bradshaw to try and I guess cure Septimus of his shell shock. The conclusion of Septimus's treatment um, or kind of counselling is the fact that it is suggested that he should go into one of Dr Holmes's homes, so an institution. This restriction on Septimus's freedom and possibility of a life is just too much. Septimus throws himself out the window, a final act I guess of communication and an image that will always stay with me with the idea of him falling on the railings. Once again the lives of Clarissa and Septimus are intertwined. Clarissa hears the news of Septimus's suicide even though they were strangers because Sir William Bradshaw is a guest at her party. Like Septimus, Clarissa also makes a move towards the window but then like committing suicide she goes back to the party. Clarissa's move towards the window and then move back into the party is often seen as her choosing life. However, in the way that I interpret it, she's not actually choosing life, she's choosing her past. Clarissa doesn't make the decision to live, she goes back to Peter Walsh and back to Sally 